Welcome back on Zoom and in person. Uh, good to see some new faces and some familiar faces again. Um, today we're going to talk about interviews. Um, but before this, I wanted to make sure I remember to remind you that, except for Maddie, thank you, if you're with us, I guess not yet. Except for Maddie, I'm still short a few brave volunteers to present papers on Thursday this week. This was communicated in an email uh, via Canvas last Friday. So hopefully that went through. Uh, hopefully you've seen an email from me about this. But please, if you haven't already uh, volunteer to present one of these papers on Thursday this week. Um, and uh, we keep this short, so about 10 minutes or so max for the presentation. Give us a highlight of, well, I, I put up some notes here for what to focus on. Um, give us some highlights of what the problem and the knowledge gap is and what they're trying to do with that paper. Um, and kind of what the overall design of the study is. You know, do they mix methods? What methods do they use? How do they mix them, et cetera, things like that. Um, and especially focus on the actual interviews. Right? Why and how, especially how, do they do said interviews? Right? So we're gonna learn today about how to do interviews and we're gonna continue doing that on Thursday this week. Um, all right. The other thing I wanted to mention before I forget is that I shared a Google Drive folder with all of you. I, I believe I've sent you all a link. And if I haven't sent you a link, then you can also find the link on the website to this folder. Um, this is where I will be posting all of the reading materials so that they're all in one place so that they're easy to find so that you don't have to you know, waste more time on trying to find stuff. Um, the papers are trivially available because you can you know, directly access them from the publishers. Some of the book chapters are maybe take a little bit more work. So I'm kind of trying to save you that part of work. Um, and in the interviews folder, there's a lot of stuff. It's organized. Uh, there's a few example papers, including the ones that are on the reading list. A um, few example papers that use interviews. Hello. Um, there's all of the chapters and kind of methodological readings for you know, how to conduct the interviews, book chapters, and so on, stuff that the lecture is based on. And actually, because today uh, I will very likely not be able to cover absolutely everything from these, even though I have prepared a summary, uh, I encourage you to actually browse, if not read the ones that you find super interesting uh, from these offline. Uh, there's a lot more in here and it's all useful. I've sort of curated the best things I could find about um, teaching people how to do interviews uh, and they are here. Um, and I've also shared four examples of interview guides or interview protocols, the list of questions and so on that people have asked as part of their interviews, as part of these four papers. There are four good examples, I thought, of interview protocols. Uh, we're going to workshop together an interview protocol in class today on some made up topic. Uh, but here you can have a few more examples to refer to as, you know, authoritative, if you will, uh, interview guides that other researchers have used as part of their studies just to have something to, to compare against. Uh, anyway, so similarly, I will be posting stuff. And in fact, I have, this is all stuff from previous years and I'll be adding stuff here, uh, curating this as we go along for other topics in this semester. So you'll find them all here. Um, okay, that's all on administrative things. Any questions about anything, commerce or projects or things before we dig in? Maddie joined. Thanks for signing up to present for Thursday. You were the first one to do so, so thank you. Okay, so then today we're going to talk about interviews. This is the sunrise from this morning, by the way. Yeah, wild. Can you believe this? It's the same uh, photographer that I follow on Twitter that takes all of these. Uh, his name is Dave DiCello. He took this this morning. 
So apparently this is what our city looked like this morning. That looks awesome. Okay, so today I wanna to talk about interviewing, well, why we do it in general as part of an empirical research study. Um, and more specifically, so how we do this, how we set this up and how we conduct interviews. Uh, and we're gonna workshop a protocol together in just a few minutes. Um, yeah, right, so this is the list of readings. Um, these are the things I mentioned, I posted in the Google Drive folder, the book chapters that I have based this lecture on. Uh, and again, you know, please take a look at this offline. There's probably a lot more good stuff in here than I'll be able to touch on in this class. Um, okay, and these are the examples to discuss on Thursday. All right, so why do we talk about interviews? Hello, welcome. Please don't worry, Just make yourself comfortable. We talk about interviews because they are uh, probably the most common methods for data gathering in qualitative research studies. Um, the other very common method are surveys, but you'll see that interviews you know, share a lot of the similarities with surveys in that sense uh, and add some strengths. Um, there's actually quite a diversity of uh, qualitative research interviews. Um, you know, if you think of the questions you ask during these, they can be very diverse, ranging from very specific things about what you had for lunch earlier today, for example, to very general things about your views on, I don't know, how the pandemic affects graduate education in the US, right? It could be anything like this. Um, in terms of the order in which you're asking these questions, um, you can, again, have anything and everything between a predetermined fixed order. You have some list of questions and you always go through that list and the order in which they're written down with every interview participant um, to something that is much more uh, organic uh, and flexible and sort of you're reacting in, in ways to what your in informants are telling you and you're steering the interviews and in directions that emerge as interesting while you're conducting these interviews right? and anything in between. Uh, and similarly, you can ask uh, for very precise you know, response responses to, I don't know, how tall are you? Right? That would warrant a very precise response in, I don't know, inches or feet or inches or centimeters. Uh, to very open-ended responses on, I don't know, harder topics. Um, so really there's a lot of diversity of kinds of questions and so on, forms of interviews. They're all, they're all valid. There's nothing wrong with either one of them. Um, they're just differently useful in different contexts. So hopefully uh, we'll see today a little bit of kind of what are the most common ways to do this. Um, I'm claiming that at least in sort of CSSE, software engineering or general computer science, empirical research, um, at least in this area, you will, or ACI probably too, um, you will most likely be uh, you know, asking somewhat specific questions, but not probably not in a fixed predefined order. Um, and you'll probably be most interested in collecting open-ended responses to these questions. Because otherwise, if you're looking for you know, very precise, fixed, closed form things, you're probably going to run a survey instead. Uh, and we will talk about surveys in an upcoming class very soon. Uh, but I, probably when you'll be doing interviews, it will be uh, most often of this form, uh, I claim. Uh, and these are uh, often referred to as semi-structured interviews. Uh, they're semi-structured in that you know, th there is some interview guide. We call that an interview protocol that lists the topics of questioning, maybe have a list some specific questions that you wanna ask, maybe uh, list some probes to follow up uh, with to those specific questions. Uh, but there's a lot of flexibility and you're not always asking all the questions in all the same orders, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility in that. Uh, okay, so the, why, why would you consider doing interviews? Well, they're a great tool for exploratory research. Um, we've already seen a few examples of research papers in the previous classes that have used interviews to um, 
uh, elicit hypotheses or to you know, understand the problem better. Uh, one of the early uh, forms of investigation. Um, right, we talked about this. They can help uh, derive hypotheses or or generate or help you build theories. Um, they're very commonly used in this format in mixed methods uh, empirical study designs where there's often some qualitative component, often using interviews to derive hypotheses, say, or build theory, followed by some further testing or validation of uh, that theory, testing of those hypotheses, for example, using a quantitative method or, or something like this. That's a very common design for studies. You'll see that a lot. Certainly not the only one. Um, I have at least one example for Thursday that we will discuss if uh, somebody signed up to present it, um, where they've used interviews at the end of a research project or research process to validate or better understand some of the findings they have uh, derived through different methods. So it's a very interesting contrast there. You know, they, instead of starting with interviews to elicit hypotheses, they use interviews to understand the results they obtained otherwise through some statistical analysis or something like that. Um, and they can be a great way to uh, validate data or findings, especially in a domain you're not super familiar with. Um, just as an aside, um, this is often a point of confusion. You can, in fact, use interviews to do quantitative research. Right, so, you know, often when you think of qualitative or when you think of research, you associate, sorry, when you think of interviews, you associate interviews with qualitative research. Um, that's a common misunderstanding. It is true that commonly they're used in, in qualitative research, but they can just as well be used in quantitative research. Um, so you could be asking, you know, very specific questions and, and uh, expecting precise answers to those. And you could use interviews to collect, I don't know, numerical data that you then analyze quantitatively in some form. There's nothing stopping you from doing this. It's a perfectly valid way of collecting numerical data about some phenomenon. Um, probably if you have cheaper, more scalable ways of collecting such data, you wouldn't choose to do interviews. Um, but, but you know, there, I can imagine scenarios where uh, you can't easily collect that data from the same participants through other means. And you know, the only way is to collect them using interviews. So you know, that's perfectly fine. Um, so you know, don't be uh, tempted into thinking that interviews are only a purely a qualitative research method. They could just as well be a quantitative research method. Their, their purpose is data collection. Interviews are a tool for data collection. What you then do with that data, how you analyze it, determines the nature of the study, uh, be it qualitative or quantitative, okay? Right, so here's another way to say the same thing. With quantitative research, the one with numbers, um, you could think of interviewees as your research subjects. Um, with qualitative research, the interviewee uh, is a research participant rather than a research subject. So they're, you know, they're actively shaping the research process rather than to passively uh, you know, providing you with data and, and you're the one sort of fully you know, driving that research process. So that's another way of saying the same uh, thing as before. Does that make sense? So this is to say that um, you can use interviews to do quantitative research uh, in, in perfectly valid and reasonable ways. I think often you won't, but that doesn't mean you can't or you shouldn't. Okay, um, so we're gonna talk about uh, these semi-structured qualitative interviews. So you know, not the ones where you're trying to I don't know, collect numerical data using interviews. Um, I'm going to focus on the ones that I think will be most common uh, in the kinds of research that you'll be doing, uh, namely the qualitative interviews. And the reason why you'll be doing these probably is 
to better understand the research topic through the perspective of your interview participants and understand how and why they've come to have those uh, particular views on that problem. Remember this discussion of the social constructivist worldview at the beginning of the semester. Uh, so this is sort of a, a typical example when you might use interviews. Um, and so you'll probably be asking uh, a lot of open questions, right, to, to tr learn from your informants. Um, you don't really have the answers yet. You're trying to understand the problem yourselves, and you'll probably be asking lots of open-ended questions. Um, you'll probably want to focus on specific situations and action sequences rather than generalities. Why do you think that is? Yes. Subjective and more subject to how you like phrase the question than the specific question, like about someone's behavior or action. Ge right. So generalities are uh, the, the data you would be collecting about the general impressions is arguably less reliable. Yep. Um, I guess my if you if you're trying to use qualitative interviews to build a theory, like asking abstract questions kind of implies you already have a theory and so like what you would want to do is ask more specific questions and see how the interviewee frames it so that you can, like they they provide their own theory rather than you imposing your theory upon them yeah so that's going to be i agree with that as well um that's going to be one of the hardest things with uh, conducting an interview is avoiding to impose your own views or biases or whatever, avoiding to do that um, and really extracting the participants' uh, views and, and impressions of whatever you're studying rather than your own. Right, so it's already, the data you're collecting is already filtered through their eyes, right? You don't want it further filtered, you know, as a second filter through your eyes on top of their eyes right this, you know you're not observing it directly firsthand you're you're getting this filtered view uh, and you want to reduce the amount of additional filtering you you add to this maybe one way of explaining this um why else why else specific things versus general things like if i ask you what did you have for lunch today versus what did you have for lunch on the 13th of September last year? Still specific, but further back in time versus what do you usually have for lunch? Not a trick question. What, what do you expect to, to get back as answers? Yeah. It, um, I think when you ask a general question, um, like the participants tend to be like, a lot more unsure about their answers. So when you ask specific ones, they're more confident. And um, like usually you can get more quantifiable often answers from them. Like if you give them a scale of say zero to 10, they can pretty accurately put it on five to four to six or something. But when you ask a very general question, they won't, won't even know how to scale as easily to interpret. Yeah, so if, you know, if I'm to uh, caricature this a little bit, um, I'm exaggerating, but I, it, it's basically two things will happen. One is um, the further back in time something happened, the less reliable people's memory of the event will be, just because that's how humans work we just won't remember most things and the longer it's been the less we will remember the less accuracy we will remember the details of something that's one um, and the second is the uh, less concrete you know question is the more likely uh, people will be to just make stuff up yeah, and a lot of times what happens is that based on the way you phrase the question, you actually can change the way they remember it. And so 
not sure how related this is to software, but in like these types of interviews with Prime, for example, um, when you ask someone about something 10 years ago and you already have findings, you're not supposed to tell them that you're finding it because you want to corroborate. But sometimes it leaks through a little bit and then they match their story to whatever new evidence you found, which actually kind of destroys the whole point of that. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about uh, and this series of lectures on interviews and the upcoming one on survey design. We're going to talk a lot about phrasing questions and you know, typical pit pitfalls and biases to try to avoid when phrasing questions uh, and some of, some of the effects of these biases on the answers you might be getting. Uh, also, some of the readings, um, the learning with stranger, learning from strangers chapter also has a really good description of this and examples of this. So please, you know, take, take a look at that as well offline. Um, that's another hard part about this, and we're going to practice this. Sophia. Yeah, so there's, um, if you fiddle with one of the things at the back, one of the things on the wall, there's a thing that says which light to turn off. Uh, what, here. The ones on the wall. Yeah, sorry about that. Thanks for turning that. Uh, light. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we should remember to please remind me to do this at the beginning of class. Thanks. I happen to forget. And thanks for bringing this up. Yeah, okay, very good. Um, okay, yeah, so we were talking about why specific instances, and ideally I'm going to add recent instances, but it's to so remember the point of, um, you know, running these interviews is uh, often to collect data about some phenomenon that you can't observe yourself otherwise, right? So you want that data to be as reliable as possible about the phenomenon you're studying, right? And, and, you know, two sources of unreliability are, you know, one um, time, right, the older something, the phenomenon happened, the event occurred, the older that thing was, the less likely people will remember what happened. And the other one is the less concrete the question, the ask, the more people are going to make stuff up. Uh, so, you know, these are two obvious things that you should always try to to avoid, right? So, you know, ask about recent over older things whenever you can, and ask about concrete events over generalities whenever you can. These are two very basic but very useful principles. Okay. Um, right. So, for example, compared to a survey uh, where, you know, you ask, you, you could ask open ended questions in a survey, there's nothing wrong with that. You often do. But compared to that format, an interview allows you typically richer engagement because it gives you, the interviewer, an opportunity to probe and, and to follow up with additional you know, sub questions or whatever. Um, it, when, whenever you know you feel like the your informants uh, have something interesting to say, you can follow up and solicit more details about this. And that's not typically an opportunity you have with surveys at all. But I mean, you know. Often you don't even know who the respondents were, but even if you do, you know, it's hard to go back and ask them to tell you more about something once they filled out a survey, much less practical. Whereas if you're having a conversation with them as part of an interview, it's much more natural and easy to do this. So you typically get richer engagement and, and information this way. Uh, yeah, you could collect data that's not recorded elsewhere. Um, richer detail, we talked about this. Um, you can triangulate it with other data sources. We talked about that. Uh, you can be used, you can use interviews to clarify things that have already happened. We talked about that a bit too. Yeah, okay. Uh, during cons, usually the sample size, there's probably, you know, compared to say a survey that you can easily uh, deploy to, I don't know, thousands of people on the internet, um, you will never be able to physically interview thousands of people yourself because you know each interview will take I don't know 30 minutes say and you know you won't have 30 minutes times a thousand to spend on just you know 
talking to these people. Plus, you know, you have to find time to schedule these interviews, and then you have to transcribe and analyze that data some way. And it's just not practical. Uh, you can't ever do this. Uh, right. We talked about time. You know, it's, it's a more complicated setup. You're actually there with them. You're having this conversation. Um, right. You know, logistics, finding the right people, scheduling uh, interview time that works for everybody. Um, right. This, this one is one we talked about this too a bit. Um, is one of the harder things. It's how do you avoid introducing your own bias as the researcher into this data that you're collecting from the informants, from the interview participants. Um, and you know, there's lots of things from very obvious things in how you phrase your questions, and we'll see lots of examples of that in, in a few minutes, uh, to more subtle things like you know, whether you're checking you, the time you know, every other minute while the interview is going on, or you're rolling your eyes when they say something, or you know, who knows what, right? So there's all kinds of subtle cues that you yourselves as the interviewers might be uh, giving to your uh, interview participants that could bias the, the data that you're collecting. So th this is always hard. Um, I guess the one thing, you know, the, the, if you need to remember one thing, it's, it's this, that the, your role as interviewer in an interview is to be as neutral as possible, All right? So that's, you should try to, that, that's what you should aim for when you're doing an interview is to collect really their, the in, informant perspectives and views on whatever questions uh, not yours, or or theirs tainted by your views. Uh, that's always going to be the hardest part. Uh, okay, time for analysis. We'll talk about that probably next week. Uh, analysis. Um, okay, so how do you do an interview? Obviously, you start from defining some research questions, um, and we shall not talk more about this because we had a whole lecture uh, not long ago on formulating research questions. Then you create and probably pilot and validate an interview guide or an interview protocol. The two are used synonymously. Uh, and we're going to workshop that in just a second. Uh, you recruit participants, you carry out the interviews, and you analyze the data. Um, and we'll talk in a lot more detail about all of these things next. Let's start with the interview guide. Um, so the guide is just that, or the protocol is just that, it's a guide. Um, it's not a formal schedule of questions to ask in that it's okay if you don't ask all of the questions. It's okay if you ask the questions in a different order. Um, it's okay if you add new questions to your guide following some earlier interviews because you've learned something interesting from the first few interviews you've conducted. And now you yourselves know to ask more questions of your next interviewees. All of these things are okay. It's not set in stone as the thing to remember here, um, but it should guide you as the name suggests in what topics to cover, what questions to ask, what specific questions to ask to a large extent, uh, what probes you know you can use to follow up to uh, those responses to uh, get greater detail from your participants, etc. Uh, yeah, and we talked about how you could change this. It can evolve during the process of conducting interviews. Uh, it needn't be static from the first interview to the very last. So it's okay to add questions or remove them if they led to dead ends. So let's see. I want to. I want to play with this a little bit. So um, let's say you're uh, trying to uh, study how, how and why academic researchers collaborate on writing papers, uh, as opposed to not collaborate on writing papers, or specifically, how do they collaborate? You know, what uh, you know, technology do they use, if, if any, uh, when collaborating? How do they manage that collaboration? Are there particular tools? You know, maybe you're in the process of building some next overleaf-like tool to help people collaborate on, you know, editing manuscripts. You know, whatever it might be. Maybe you're just interested in improving the quality of overall academic collaborations in, in our field. Uh, regardless, um, imagine this is your goal. So now, 
I want you to think of a set of questions, an interview guide, an interview protocol that you could use to study this. Um, you know, let's say you had people, you had access to people uh, at CMU for, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 minutes each. What would you ask them? Uh, you know, in pursuit of this research goal, what are the kinds of things you would ask them? Okay. Uh, and I want you to write down on whatever device you have access to or paper, some questions that, or probes or topics that you would ask these people. Um, and also the rationale for doing this, like what purpose does that question serve? Um, so let's see if we could do this in uh, groups somehow. So you know, folks over Zoom, um, I can put you all in a breakout room so you can freely chat to each other. How does that sound? And maybe here we could do, uh, how about we do four groups here, uh, kind of you know, having people turn to one another uh, given, given tables. Yeah, so like you all hear the first two tables, right. And then here are the first two tables, last two tables on that side, last two tables over there. And then folks over Zoom, I shall put you in a breakout room. So let's take, let's take five to 10 minutes to think about this. First off, other than like demographic what well, I should put you in a Zoom if I can find my mouse cursor. What sort of social setting do you hear? I'm afraid to think of the term group that is implied necessarily having templates. So maybe like yeah, that's good one. Um, because then, yeah, you can actually like, okay, I refer to this person. You know, yeah, yeah. What's the last? What's your last or current research project? Um, there was this really brilliant like i guess uh, uh, that's to like, the tall people card which had like business cards and had like all of the answers to the most common questions that these are and I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure let's see what you all came up with time let's see what you came up with how about we start with the zoom room um so let's do this in the following way um let, I, I will write down here uh questions that you all uh, propose um, so we're going to kind of do round robin and give everybody a chance to propose some questions, but I'm not going to ask every group to give me the whole guide at once. So, you know, give me the first, you know, a couple of questions that you might start with and let's see what other groups thought, you know, would be good starts. Um, and then we're going to kind of iteratively build it together like this. So let's see from the zoom room, how would you start this? And I'm going to write, hopefully the screen is still shared. Yes. Can you all see me typing? Yeah, it's shared. Okay, we, perfect. We started by saying we would uh, like do like an introduction and like 
introduce the purpose of the interview and then our first questions would be like demographic so we could understand like what field of study are they in because we thought that collaboration might look different depending on like what discipline you're in and we have other things like their gender identity and their age as well why do you think those are important to to ask about which ones um all, all of them the demographics uh, the field of study we thought collaboration might be different depending on your field just from our conversation um and the gender identity and age uh i can't give you a good answer to um i guess um you know, I'm, I'm not really sure if like specific demographic questions are important because like we're not really looking at like characteristics of the population because it's going to be a small sample size. So maybe certain demographics are more important to collect than others. I, I think, sorry, uh, I think for age, it, it makes sense because uh, people tend to stay with the technique they are used to and uh for example uh some tools may not be available at that point when they start to collaborate but later for example already was introduced recently but uh people like uh old people <laughs> yeah may use old-fashioned tools yeah cool okay oh okay. yeah that seems seems reasonable Good night. yeah okay. i was gonna say that it would be useful um, in case we, since we have a small sample size, it would be useful to know if all 20 participants, for example, were people who identify as men in their 20s, that would be important to report in your paper for the sake of knowing. Okay, yeah. So, um, okay, that's a good distinction. I think, I think this is true in general. So, um, you know, if these are, if you have hypotheses about how these factors might influence, you know, their collaboration practices and whatnot, then it makes sense to ask about them for that purpose, right? If they're part of the study design and the theory or testing, but otherwise it's also maybe useful to report on the description of your population so that readers of your paper can judge, you know, whether their context, you know, might be somehow meaningfully different and they might expect that some of these results won't hold. So I think that makes sense to me as well. Uh, Elijah. I was going to add, like, in the interview studies I've worked on, these sorts of questions are typically in, like, a screening survey or a pre interview because it lets you just get down to business in the interview and just ask your questions. Yeah, I, I agree with this. I would also personally not start with most of these demographics. Um, I, I think the field of study is relevant. That makes sense to me. But some of these other things I would probably put somewhere else if I were to keep um, just, uh, yeah, just my first instinct. And I think, you know, pre-screening survey or something is a good place to have them or maybe at the very end or something like that. Okay, let's see what else so, uh, in the room. How else would you start? Thank you very much. Oh, I, I keep writing. Well, anything else you would do differently or how, how did you start? Role in the collaboration. What collaboration? Oh, that's true. Well, yeah. I guess you also have to ask if you ever collaborate. But did you? No. I, I'm, did you? What is the first question you asked in in your guide and your group? It's like, what is your field? And then, like, what is your role? And that was meant to be like a choice between. I assume you've already like used a pair of academics, like grad student, professor, or whatever. Um, and then the next question is like, 
only the good who disapprove of wrong is a good person, really. Then it's what person is abused is or what he disapproves of behavior is what person is abused for consideration. Anything else? Uh, give me more. Or th thoughts on these and or other questions? Other groups? Yep. Yeah. Uh, tell me about the last paper that you were. Yeah, we framed it more in terms of a specific project. Yeah. I'm taking some uh, artistic liberties here and I'm removing this a little further up than, uh, than at the very bottom. Because uh, I think maybe, you know, maybe. Kind of narrowing down to some particular episode would be more useful before asking about these the role in that you know collaboration in that project. That was our next question. What was your role in this project? And then yeah. And we also said if they didn't mention other people, ask like, did you work with other people on that project? Yeah. We started off with sort of an existence, an existence question. So how often uh, do you work? Why is that? Why do you care about frequency? Um, uh, if, if I guess if we uh, and I get asked this question and those people don't come up, um, then maybe uh, this isn't something that we should, this is a different thing we should spend effort on. So establishing that the problem, that the problem exists and is, is important. Um, as opposed to people just editing in isolation or something, or they're not collaboratively editing. Maybe we should look at the other two collaborations. That's what I was trying to do with this year, because like if they had done 10 papers instead of only on their own, like that's kind of relevant to how we respond, and vice versa. Like if they're constantly collaborating, doing a particular attitude towards uh huh. Uh huh. So if they have a lot of experience with collaborating or co-editing, maybe they've seen more problems or something. You want to particularly hear from them. That makes sense too. Yep. What else? What's next? Uh, Zoom or Room? For the form of communication and also the wider communication and editing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Why do you, why, why is frequency important? Um, I guess just it's somewhere where you just things have to be about it. Maybe you can consider like how much you're really working together or whether it was like we have a senior advisor and we just like do the paper. Like before you submit it, they might not like want to say that, but you could sort of, you know, like maybe they'll be like, oh, well, you know, just make a third class and then have one person in that group. But I think it would be pretty useful. Um, I think what our group sort of did was our interview for a poll was really centered around this question of tell me about your last piece you worked on. And we try to break it down into different phases. So we first asked, like, um, tell us about how you and your collaborators wrote a first draft of your publication after you had your feedback on it. And then afterwards, you might say, like, describe how you and your collaborators gave feedback on this version. And then after that, we might say, describe how you and collaborators implemented the feedback of this version. So really trying to break down this process step by step. Um, and with, even within each of these phases, you can ask follow-up questions.
questions like, what tools did you use? What challenges did you encounter? What did your other collaborators do at this stage? So we can really try to tease out these details that might be cool for this whole um, topic. This is getting very small to read now. So I'm probably <laughs> going to, even for me, probably going to uh, stop this uh, soon. We've got to see you, hopefully you get a flavor for this. So I, I guess one, uh, a couple of points on this. So um, the same point that I mentioned in the beginning of class about asking for specific instances over asking for generalities. This is a good scenario to see the need for that. Also, because you know, if I ask for generalities, uh, like how do you usually collaborate? Well, there is no usual, right? You know, sometimes I do more writing, sometimes I do less writing. You know, sometimes I have more collaborators, sometimes I have fewer. Sometimes I have people who hate LaTeX and force me to use something else. You know, th th there is no typical, right? They're all different in some meaningful way. So. Um, you either so you, you either ask me about you know ten of these right and you know we sit there for a whole day and you know you buy lunch or something because <laughs> um, it's going to take a while or you hope to get at this diversity of scenarios by just asking different people you know for example I would probably ask a person about their most recent instance of such a collaborative project in which they. Uh, collaboratively edited some manuscript prior to submission. Um, and I would hope to get at this diversity of scenarios by just asking a bunch of different people. But you know, each person I would ask specifically about this one most recent instance to keep each interview short um, and you know, concrete to, to have it be more truthful rather than uh, you know, like when I have all of these different scenarios, I start maybe I start just mixing things up, you know, maybe I didn't do that thing in this project, but, you know, because they were kind of asking me in general, you know, I did that one thing in this other project, but I'm going to mention it now because I don't remember, you know, who knows? It just, it's less reliable. Uh, the other thing um, I guess that you're seeing a little bit uh, here already is kind of starting very broadly. And in fact, actually starting, uh, this was pretty good. i um, starting with just some context setting. Right. So starting by you know, introducing yourselves, introducing the goals of the research project, uh, maybe um, further reminding the, your interviewee why you're talking to them uh, and not some other person. You know, how is it that their opinion is unique and useful to you for this particular study? And you know, why them? Right. And, and things of that nature. Um, and uh, kind of, you know, slowly narrowing this down and diving deeper into this particular instance of some collaboration. I really like the idea of breaking this down into steps, you know, like were there multiple drafts and, you know, what happened in between, uh, looking at different aspects of this, you know, was, was there feedback exchange or was there, you know, direct editing or whatever, overwriting of uh, stuff that uh, collaborators wrote, you know, kind of going into these different steps of the process that seems useful. Um, I I liked a lot of these general questions about um, kind of understanding their scenarios. You know, do they, uh, do, what kind of experience do they have with uh, collaborating and co-editing, you know, and how might that influence their challenges and their uh, preferences for tools and whatnot. So these are, these are all, uh, these are all fine. I'm not super sold on the frequency questions by themselves because when I think of frequency questions I think of I don't know a survey or something like this where I'm trying to do some sort of some kind of numerical analysis statistical analysis of the, the data that I'm collecting this way um, I, I'm more interested in kind of the specific you know steps they took and challenges they faced and you know issues with the, the collaborations rather than kind of how frequently these things uh, happen necessarily because I don't know if I can trust their quantification of frequency in the first place. And also, I don't know if it's really the best method to get at this kind of data. Just 
Yeah, side comment. Yeah, there was. Um, are you saying that you differently phrase that question? Is you prefer to collaborate in person with live or um, with offline using a tool? And if so, why? So that kind of answers the frequency without giving, asking them for a number. Yeah, do you prefer to collaborate live or in person? Sorry, uh, or, or using some computer mediated thing? That's fine, except except that is again a generality um so it, it's not ideal in that you know there's probably not one size fits all answer you know maybe sometimes i prefer this sometimes i have constraints that force me to prefer that um maybe it's not and, and it's also it's not specific it's, it's general right so i think in, to the extent that you can steer away from generalities and stay concrete and steer away from things that are distant in the past and stay recent. Like these are the two like, most basic principles. Yeah. Um, even if you have a concrete example, would it be okay to ask questions like, what did you, like about this, your last paper you worked on, what did you like about the collaboration process or what pain points did you have? Yeah, yes. Um, that's a great question. So. Yes, it's okay to ask this. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the way you're asking this um, may bias people's responses. So for example, if you ask, I overheard some group uh, while they were brainstorming, uh, something like, you know, what did you hate the most about this uh, particular collaboration? But if, so if that's your question, right, it, it implies that they must have hated something. In fact, they must have hated multiple things and they have to pick the thing they hated the most. Um, so you know, it sort of sets the frame of mind that this was a bad experience, um, right? That's your frame of mind. It may not be theirs. You know, maybe they had a, a good experience, but they're forced, right, by this, you know, uh, anchoring that you're providing to exaggerate the badness of their experience, right? To please you, uh, the interviewer. Um, so um, one way to do this is to uh, preface this by saying, you know, I'm gonna ask you about, bo both about uh, things you particularly enjoyed in this collaboration, as well as things that you wish had gone differently or you know, something like this. And I'm gonna start with things you particularly enjoyed. And, you know, and then you, know, you ask them and they tell you, and then you go back and you ask them about things they particularly hated, right? U using more neutral language than that. Uh, but you sort of preface it by saying, I'm going to ask you about both aspects of this phenomenon. Therefore, I'm not imposing my, you know, predisposed uh, value, you know, of one over the other. Um, and I'm telling you that up front, just so you know that we're kind of starting from this neutral ground and you can tell me about both. That's one way to do this. Okay, so let me go on with stuff I have here. Um, there's a lot of stuff uh, here, so we may likely not go over everything, but there's recordings and there's readings and there's all this other stuff to help. Okay, yeah, so general structure, um, this hourglass structure is a good heuristic. They usually start relatively general you know setting the context and whatnot um and you kind of dive deeper into some particular instance of some phenomenon uh, and then you kind of narrow back sorry uh, broaden the scope back out to you know other examples of the same phenomenon perhaps that they are offer uh, willing to give you or, or things like this um and uh yes this is a good uh, probe to have, you know, is there anything you'd like to add something along those lines? Or is there anything I should have asked, uh, but I haven't, that you're, you're willing to tell me about? You know, this is a good way to um, fill in potential blind spots you might have when developing this interview guide. Uh, and, you know, obviously end on a positive, um, you know, end with something uh, on, on a light question, not the you know, hardest one, uh, and obviously express your appreciation for their time and whatnot. Um, yeah, we talked about concrete examples over generalities. Okay, uh, 
yeah, how do you find them? You can read more about this. Uh, okay. These are the different steps, if you will. If, I'm, if I am to break down this process of interviewing into multiple steps, um, these are, this is one possible breakdown. Um, so you start by motivating your interviewees to participate and to produce information. That means, you know, you make them feel comfortable, you, um, you know, the, describe the study and the setup and mention how long they're expected to sit there with you and all of this. Um, describe how the information you're collecting from them is going to be used. If you're recording this, which you probably will, you know, mention that, ask for their consent. There's an official CMU uh, consent form that they have to uh, sign uh, anyway. But you know, remind them of this, remind them of how you're going to co uh, collect and store and, and use this data, et cetera. Uh, right. Um, so try to make them feel uh, safe to communicate freely uh, without fear of being judged. Like, don't be judgy. Right. Um, don't, uh, you know, that's the hardest part. I mentioned uh, also earlier, you know, staying neutral is one of the hardest parts in this. Like, you know, don't, don't roll your eyes or, you know, judge the way they've acted in a particular situation, either explicitly or non verbally, if you will, you know, by like, oh, like, how could you do this? Like, oh, you didn't, you didn't give them, you didn't write your uh, paragraph in time. Like, oh, you, you were late with your edits. Oh, you didn't provide my feedback. You know, what kind of advisor are you? <laughs> right. So, you know, as much as you're wanting to inject your human reaction to the comments they're making, you know, try not to do that. Um, right. So these are the kinds of things that it's good to have answers ready for uh, because they might ask you if you're not otherwise volunteering this information in the first place. You know, who's paying for the study? Why is this happening? Why did you select them? Uh, what happens to the data, so uh, confidentiality is also very important. Um, okay, then you're asking them a bunch of questions. Um, so try to avoid asking multiple questions at once. For example, why did you join this open source project? And do you think it has brought benefits to your programming experience? It's fine to ask both of these, but not at the same time, not together, right? Because, you know, which one are they going to respond to you know maybe the first maybe the second maybe something else altogether right so don't mix questions um try to avoid leading questions for example you know i might say so you felt that using this natural language to code copilot like ai improved your productivity significantly didn't it right so you know you that's kind of like the, the hate, how you hated this. It was a terrible collaboration, wasn't it? Tell me all the things you hated about it. Um, so, you know, instead, ask something more neutrally. You could ask something like, you know, what, if any impact, did this tool have on your productivity? Could you describe that to me, please? Um, or, you know, your parents uh, pushed you to study computer science, didn't they? Or, you know, how satisfied were you with using this NL2 code plugin? And so what's a way to fix this? How satisfied were you on a, I don't know, scale, some scale? How satisfied were you with using NL to code this plugin? How do I fix this? Or do you agree that it's broken? Anybody on Zoom, do you agree that this question as formulated can be improved? How satisfied were you with using this particular tool? Uh, yeah, I think. You could ask, start much more open-ended with just um, what it, what was your experience like using this tool? Um, what did you, what do you have to say about using this tool? How would you yep. rate your experience? Yep. Not even use the word satisfied. Yep, yep, yep. All of these are good. Um, if I, if I force you to use the word satisfied, is there a way to make this better? Down, 
yes, that's that's often the uh, the way out of a situation like this. It's to uh, phrase it bivalently to say, you know, how satisfied or dissatisfied were you with this particular tool, right? Offering both answer options. Um, I'm insisting on this a little here because it also comes up often when we do surveys and you ask people to rate something on a Likert scale and you always have questions much like this of you know satisfaction with something. Um, so this will come up also uh, in surveys, probably more than here. I think I think the questions you had, Charity, were better here. Uh, the more open-ended ones were better for an interview. Um, but just in case, uh, this will come back to bite us in a survey later, which it might. Um, okay, let's see. Avoid assuming that the answer to a question is so obvious that it need not be asked, the question that is. So, you know, when you ask how concerned are you about your privacy online, there's a built-in assumption that people are or should be concerned with their privacy online. So, um, you know, maybe you want to start even more open-ended than that and try to understand you know, if they are concerned and, and how before asking them how much they are concerned. Um, right, so try imposing your perception. For example, often you will want to summarize something they've said back to them to make sure you've understood it. Uh, and when you're doing that, try to do this again in a neutral way using their words, not yours. So for example, you know, avoid saying something like, so what you're really telling me is that you loved this NL2 code plugin, right? Yes. Um, I just wonder what if you miss, what if you're worried about whether or not you understand what the participant is saying, can you ask questions to verify that you're interpreting you're interpreting what they said correctly or? yes you can and you should you should do that um, just try to do it in a neutral way and using their own words uh you know if possible rather than your you know interpretation of their words um and you know, try to ask in an open-ended way you know could you could you please tell me more about this you know if, if that may be until you're satisfied that you have understood it or you've captured all of it Yes, you, you should absolutely do this because otherwise you, you don't trust the data, right? If you don't understand, you know, even what they're trying to communicate, you won't be able to use this data for much. Um, okay, yeah, another one, avoid ending the interview on a difficult topic, a threatening or painful topic, just because you don't want them to leave the interview, I don't know, uh, feeling hurt in some way. Uh, so try to finish uh, with an opportunity for them to make further comments about the subject uh, that maybe you haven't covered already. This is a very common uh, question that most everybody asks at the end of an interview. What else, if anything, should I have asked you? You can literally ask this question at the end. Uh, and you know, usually people they will tell uh, people will tell you something that you haven't considered um, in your in your guide. So that's always a safe thing to end with. Okay, what you sh should you do instead? These are all things to avoid. Uh, ask simple, direct, clear questions. Uh, try to be flexible because the topics may shift as your uh, the interview goes on. Uh, you, they might tell you something interesting and you might end up going on an interesting tangent and that's totally okay. Um, try to open with a question that can be answered easily uh, and without potential embarrassment or distress so that you don't again uh, you know put them in this defensive mode where they feel bad about themselves or what have you um, so ask for some um, factual or descriptive information you know could you tell me what your what this last project you worked on was uh, what was your role in that project whatever so something factual and descriptive um, that does not carry any uh, value judgment Right. You can ask open-ended questions like, please walk me through a day in your work life. Uh, you can ask specific uh, subjective experience questions like, what was attending uh, empirical methods like for you? Like amazing, right? <laughs> right so that, you know, that would be a totally neutral way of, of asking this question. Um, you know, follow up on what the participants are saying, ask for clarifications, for more details, for stories, for examples, you know, 
all of the above, that's all is fine. Um, ask them to reconstruct, not to remember their experience, if at all possible, because memory is unreliable. We know this from psychology. Um, so ask them things like what happened in that particular situation, uh, rather than do you remember what happened? So the first one forces them to reconstruct in their minds the experience and play it back. The second one sort of relies apparently on a different memory structure and is less reliable. So that was really interesting. Right, so what happened, very subtle difference. What happened versus do you remember what happened puts people in a sort of different position to either reconstruct the experience or rely on their memory of the experience. And you want the one where they're reconstructing, re recreating the experience. That's more useful, more reliable. Is there a reference to this? I think there should be Yeah, I, I picked this up in one of the readings, um, in the, one of the chapters, and they talk about that more in the chapters. Um, I don't recall which of the three or four chapters uh, this came from, but you could find that easily enough. Uh, or I can, I can look for it offline. I thought this was really interesting, right? Because it seems so trivial and subtle, right? But apparently has a, makes a huge difference. Yeah, and as for concrete things, we talked about that. Um, okay, probes, let's say, okay, yeah. Let's skip this, probing. So probes are kind of follow-up questions that you might ask um, in response to something you're, you're hearing. So for example, you could ask open-ended probes like, what were the major responsibilities? What were your major responsibilities in this last collaboration? You know, maybe they start by telling you about some paper they collaborated on. You could ask, what were your major responsibilities in this collaboration? That's an open-ended probe because you know they get them to elaborate about this. Um, you could ask specifically. So let's say they tell you uh, something like, "I've always had the ability to learn a programming language quickly." Um, you could follow up by asking, what specific steps do you take to learn a new language? Or did you take to learn this, you know, Python or whatever you learned most, most recently? Um, or, you know, if they say, if you ask them, how would you rate your contributions to this open source project? And they say, I think I'm a major contributor. You could follow up and probe by saying, I'm glad to hear this. What contributions in particular made you feel that way? They felt they were a major contributor. You know, what made you feel that way? Is a specific probe you can uh, you can ask. Um, this is an example of the bipolar thing we talked about earlier. Um, you you preface by saying most people I talk to can identify aspects of working remotely that they really liked and aspects of working remotely that they disliked. Um, would you tell me about those aspects uh, too? And you start with the ones that, that you know. They, would, could you tell me first about the aspects you really liked, and then you ask them also about the ones they disliked? And this way, you you, you keep uh, both poles here. Uh, elaboration probes. Is there anything else? What else can you think about? Any other thoughts? Is there anything else I should have asked you, sir? Right, this is a way, uh, a reflective probe. This is a way where you're reflecting something they've just told you. This is in response to your earlier question. Um, reflecting something they've told you back to them to make sure you understood it and to kind of force them to elaborate. So, you know, maybe they tell you, I've been here at CMU for 15 years and I don't feel I've been treated fairly, fairly at all. Okay, uh, and then you played you play this back to them in their own words, say, you feel you haven't been treat, uh, treated fairly, you, again, using the same words they've, they've used. And this forces them to you know, elaborate more on this, you know, tell you in, in what ways and, and so on. Uh, and you know, it helps you uh, get more information. Uh, yeah, indirect follow-ups, you know, tell me more. I'd like to hear more about this point. Could you elaborate? Uh, and finally here, pause. Pause is probably, the most effective mechanism to get your informant to contribute more information. I 
because it gets really awkward, <laughs> right? Because they'll feel like, wait, what's going on? Like, they, they feel like they should say something. Right? And if it's just you and them, even more so, they will feel like they should say something. Like here, you can sort of hide in the, in the crowd a little bit. Um, but if it's just you and some person in an interview, uh, you pausing implies very strongly to them that you're waiting for them to tell you more. Uh, so this is a very effective you know, probe without you saying anything. So where does the interviewee who paused? Say it again? Where does like, the interviewee who paused, like the interviewee who paused? Yeah, so if it's the interviewee who paused, um, well, I think you, you proceed with your interview protocol and you continue with the kinds of questions or you know, probes, you ask more probe questions to follow up or you ask the next set of topics. You just go on with your, uh, with your interview or you ask them to tell you more. If they, you know, if they haven't told you enough and they pause and you wanna hear more, you probe them and you ask them to tell you more. You know, you can say that's very interesting. You know, please tell me more. Or can you can you say more about that? Okay. So, looking at the time, I'll stop here. Um, please either take a look at the rest of the deck, or you could look at the recording from last year, in which I think we went over the whole deck, uh, or look at the readings, which have more context and details on all of these. But please do that. Um, and if you haven't already, have you? Sign up for the uh, presentations on Thursday. Can I, is there a browser? Okay, we have at least three. So worst case, we just do the three if there are no volunteers for the other two, uh, but hopefully we'll uh, find some more volunteers for the others as well. Uh, okay, so I'll stop here. I will see you all on Thursday. Thanks.